So in just a moment, I have Masha and Shelby taking over. But when Masha said she'd like to do a talk on human metrics, didn't even look at her abstract or proposal. I just know Masha and Shelby, and they're doing amazing work. So ladies, it's all your show. Thank you so much, Lance. It is so great to be here. And uh, I'm sure track the other track is great, but this one's going to be better. So stay on this channel. <laughs> um, and what we have in store for you is a CISO's frenemy, the human X factor. Uh, by way of introduction, I'm Masha Sadova. I have the privilege of being the co-founder and president of a company called Elevate Security. And we're doing some incredible work by creating a platform that helps companies measure human risk in their organization and then understanding how risky employees are, create and orchestrate security controls and policies and personalized security experiences for individuals in a company to reduce risks like ransomware and account takeover. So really excited to share some of my knowledge around um, things that I've learned in, uh, as a practitioner for over a decade, plus working with um, dozens of different companies. Over to you, Shelby. Fantastic, thank you, Masha. And I'm Shelby Flora here. For those who don't know me, I'm a managing director in Accenture Security Practice. And one of the hats that I wear is being the global lead for our offering around cyber resilient teams and organizations, which is all about bringing those functional and those technology controls to have those high-performing teams and wider enterprises. So what we wanted to start with today, and I know some of this is gonna be like, ah, does Shelby Masha and Shelby and Masha. But we wanted to set the context of like, what's the big meaty problem that we're trying to solve for? And quite frankly, it comes down to the dollars and cents of it all. As of this year, cybercrime, which we're all trying to fight against, is going to cost $6 trillion loss out of the global economy, which to put that into some perspective, that's the size of Germany's economy. And this, as we can all expect, is only going to continue to have an upward trend line and get worse, um, increasing to over $10.5 billion in just four short years. So additionally, you know, when we're trying to have these conversations with our organizations and with our leadership, particularly with business stakeholders, you know, it's kind of, you know, the whiff on what does it mean for me being a, a business leader and trying to interact with business leaders is quite frankly, when it comes down to it, if you are unfortunate to find yourself in an incident in a breach situation, the end of end cost of buttoning that up is about $13 million. And if you find yourself servicing and being of service, to a public facing organization, it's about a seven and a half percent stock decrease of value that's immediately taken out um, of the, the organization based on a particular incident. So then it becomes, you know, well, what are the biggest opportunity in Boulder areas that we can address and really start to dig into when it comes to protecting against cybercrime and cyber threats? And I think we all know that a chain is only as strong as its biggest link. Yeah, so this is not going to be a surprise to any of you, but the largest untapped potential we have in security is the human element. And as Alex talked today in his keynote from the Verizon Data Breach Report, 85% of the breaches they looked at in the last year were due to some element of human error, human fallibility. Now, if you unpack that a little bit further, 80% um, of those were due to weak or stolen credentials. And the thing is, most of the C-suite that are interviewed or spoken with actually have an understanding that this is a core problem. This is not new. No one's going to really fight you on the fact that this is an unsolved problem. Something like 84% of the C-suite acknowledges that this is a huge problem. So I am I know we're preaching to the choir here, but why we're offering these statistics is because we want to empower you to be able to go back with some of these numbers to your leadership to have an effective business conversation because the impact of the work that we can do to the space um, and its ability to transform our cyber resiliency is enormous, it's enormous. It's $5.4 trillion lost uh, from the global economy. And it's a huge, huge loss. And so we have an amazing opportunity to tackle this, but we have to do this in a way that requires a new framework and a new way of thinking. Because if the way we had been doing this with a lot of focus on awareness and training as our core tool sets, we wouldn't be seeing these numbers today. If those were truly as effective as we were hoping it would be, we would not have 85% breaches due to human error. So it's time to think about 
expanding our capabilities in the space and thinking about the problem from a data centric perspective. And that is what Shelby and I are going to spend the next few minutes talking to you all about. So based on that, what Masha kind of led us into was, okay, we need to start thinking about this a little bit differently. We need to start adding more tools to our toolbox, you know, what's a must have utility. And it got me thinking about my father, um, ex-Marine Navy pilot, Marine and Navy pilot and commercial pilot. And when I'm growing up in Kansas City, Missouri, he never left the house without three things, without fail, money, chapstick, healthy lips are important, as well as his Swiss army knife. And I, re I remember asking him like, you know, why, why do you always have a Swiss army knife, dad? This is a little bit bizarre. He's like, I can go throughout my day and not run into any problems so long as I have my Swiss army knife. He's like, open up that pack of oranges you needed for your soccer game, done. Open up that bottle of water, done. Um, and so it really got me thinking, I was, you know, reflecting on these stories, you know, how do these seemingly kind of useful, but like, the solitary use, you know, bits of tool come together and make, you know, a proper utility that you can't leave the house without. So how do these little bits of metal become that thing that you always check before you leave the house? And so how do you bring together these seemingly disparate parts of unrelated data that we all have in our environment, being a hyper digital world that we find ourselves in, to create a picture, an objective picture of human risk? If we can bring this all together, you know, this could be our cybersecurity Swiss Army knife. Knowing that this is our biggest opportunity, our addressing human risk, if we can objectively score it, this, this could pay dividends. So there's a lot on the slide, and I'm going to walk you through this um, step by step. So the question is, how do you actually start using this unrelated data? Let's start at the very top. So if we think about risk just as an overarching perspective of like, well, how risky is my organization? We can't really apply very tailored controls. We're doing one size fits all training, one size fits all policies. Now, if we can identify risk at an individual level, it opens up our tool belt to be able to have very precise and tailored course corrections. Now, what do I mean when I say risk at an individual level? How likely and what is the impact of someone, let's call, let's call her Susie, uh, uh, how likely is she going to introduce an incident in our organization? Now, how in the world are we going to find out that information? If we only use the metrics we have today, which are really focused around engagement, we can't get to that information. It's how, how many brown bags or how, what kind of trainings has Susie gone to? And that shows what Susie knows, not what Susie does. And what Susie does is the thing that we really care about. And as, as Shelby was just mentioning at the beginning, the great news is you actually have that information at your disposal. Now, I want to bring your attention to the bottom of this slide. You see all those gray boxes? Those are all the data sources that you have available in your organization today that can help paint a picture of the security decisions that Susie is making. Is she clicking on actual phishing attacks? Is she mishandling data or does she have no track record whatsoever of accidentally emailing people? Does she try to download malware that has to be stopped by your endpoint? Um, is she using MFA on as many devices as possible? Does she snooze her device security, like her patch reminder, like it's a reminder to go to the gym or is she on top of it as fast as possible? So you see all of these disparate data sets, when we start pulling them together, paint a picture of what Susie does. Now you have two other buckets that are really important. What are the attacks she's receiving? How often is she targeted? And then what's her access? What's her blast radius if she does make a mistake? And now we can create these mappings of security behaviors, which in and of itself is already valuable to understand how risky she might be in physical security or in malware. But then we can start aggregating these behaviors across these buckets to understand what kind of business risk Susie is causing. So let's take ransomware, which is super top of mind for all of us. Well, if we take a look how uh, susceptible she has been to phishing, to malware, to device security, to internet browsing and, and identity, identity security, all of which help enable a successful ransomware attack if executed poorly, um, we can see how likely Susie is to introduce that kind of business risk to our organization. And in some, we can aggregate that up to our, to our departments, our managers and org overall. And so we're getting much more precise with these data sets. Next slide, please. 
So that's the first half. That's understanding where, where your risk is. But now the second question is like, well, what do we do with it? And having this type of visibility introduces a menu of uh, interventions that we could do. Most organizations that I work with and Shelby and I start, start have conversations with often start with an always trust approach. One size fits all, everyone gets the same training. It's either you've done it or you haven't. But once you start thinking about a data-centric risk approach, you first start getting to visibility. You understand your hotspots so you can understand where you're focusing your time and attention. From there, you can start doing more tailored feedback around where people need to improve on and what they're doing great on a very individual level. That's awesome, but there's also so much more we can do. The next piece is taking that information and pushing it out to all the places where security teams make decisions about access, about exceptions. So for example, the help desk is receiving um, an exception request from, from Susie to run software on her machine that isn't whitelisted. How do they know to do it or not? Um, this risk is another piece to contribute to it. And the last, which is a place where this industry um, is moving towards is tailored security. How do we create just enough security controls, just enough tools, enough policies, enough lockdown to match the level of risk that Susie is exhibiting? It's not treating her like she is a pariah or the weakest link, but it is matching her level of need based on how vigilant she is to the type of security controls and support we can provide as a security team, making sure that we are matching those two correctly. So that is the, the evolution of what, if, what can happen once we start measuring risk and, and thinking about the human, human risk in this capacity. And simply put, and I know this is a, a bit of a, a flip and phrase, but capturing this human risk data, which means, once again, that data is available in your environment, is like gold. The possibilities are absolutely limitless. And this is where I geek out a little bit putting both my functional and my technical hat on is, you know, use case number one, that very top line, I'm sure everyone's eyes are lighting up um, on the, the call today is not, this will help you maximize your investment dollars that you are getting for your security education and awareness programs, because you'll be able to see where you need to be spending a little bit more TLC. Let's not worry about finance. They're fine. It's HR who's fumbling the football. So let's focus on them to get, to reduce their risk, to then demonstrate to our leaders that our investments in the, the human firewall and addressing the human attack service are in fact worth it. You'll be heroes. Now, and additionally, now this is, you know, the best defense against these ever-changing threat actors and bad guys and gals who are, are very smart and always trying to, to outwit us is having the technology plus human controls. That's the best way that we shore up the defenses on behalf of our companies. So imagine this, working with your identity and access management team and taking that human risk score and putting it into your authentication system like an Okta. You know, someone falls below a certain threshold, risk threshold shoot, let's force another factor, let's end their session to really make sure we do want these folks getting into to our network. Same thing with access management. Let's move it into a four drop or a sale point and let's do a certification for anyone who's access level, particularly if they have access to privileged systems or infrastructure, if their risk threshold falls below an acceptable level, let's reach out to that line manager just saying, do we really want Susie to have access uh, system admin access to all of our, our Linux boxes. And then this is where the where I, my eyes light up is when you start being able to do risk-based security decisions and tailor security decisions, your actual operational costs will start to go down, which is music to any business leader's ears. Because what you'll be able to do is you'll be able to start automating low risk decisions and then giving more of that time and energy back to the back to the business. So the possibilities are absolutely limitless in this space. You can do adaptive policy management, insider threats gonna love this, and so is your, your IRM team, knowing that this is more information to get to tailored security controls of human plus technology to help you help your companies have a fighting chance against this ever evolving threat landscape. So with that, <laughs> Who would we be if we didn't give you some assembly instructions for your very own Swiss Army knives? So first and foremost, step number one is understand by pulling this data together that's already out there, you have it in there, there you can do it yourself. There's a lot of tools coming on the market to, to help with this. 
but understand where your risk areas are, understand where your top user generated incidents are. So step number one is if it's phishing, educate more in phishing and target the parts of the business that, that are really fumbling that, that football. If it's device security, do, do the same. And then start to have those leadership conversations because I've had several board presentations recently where this is actually becoming quite the hot topic is what are we doing to level up the security hygiene acumen of our leaders? It's becoming a new leadership criteria to succeed in these corporate digital businesses. So once you start having these leadership conversations, you're getting visibility into your highest risk groups, you know, and we're launching our targeted behavioral change campaigns, then we really start thinking about that human plus technology. Start having conversations with your, your SOC and maybe ingesting this into whatever SIM solution you're using, Splunk, Arc, Site, whatever. We're having conversations with those who are running your INAM control family and seeing how you can incorporate this extra bit of data feed in, into those solutions to start tailoring those security controls, as well as getting more proactive eyes to monitor those high-risk groups. And then it all comes down to you know, measure progress in ROI. Before we did some research at Accenture, right before the pandemic, security investments were actually falling. Um, I think we all remember like the heyday about five to seven years ago. It almost felt like we could we could do no wrong. But you know, as any good business leader, they're always asking, you know, can we tighten up the, the belt a little bit? So by having this data to show that you were measurably reducing the, the human risk of the organization helps to have those more business-oriented conversations to say, yes. This effort, this investment is in fact worth it because we're keeping our risk at an acceptable level um, based on quantitative objective data that you already have in your environment. So Masha, what are the key factors to a successful cybersecurity program? Yeah, so you, you hit upon this a little bit, but it's really important to understand what are the business objectives that you are trying to get at and what are the business risks your program can use to, to reduce, um, uh, reduce the risk in your organization. Uh, so we just talked a little bit about how you might be able to get some of these data sets that are existing in security tools uh, in your organization. But I wanna walk through just a couple of use cases where I've seen um, customers uh, and clients of ours utilize this approach to effectively address this business risk and optimize security culture, optimize security controls in their environment. So the first one that comes to mind is an organization that uses used individual security uh, risk for their employees to understand who needed what kind of training in their organization. People who had really perfect track records over the course of several years in specific behaviors like malware or phishing were automatically opted out of the training because they already passed the real world example. And they had the audit logs to prove it to, to auditors where people who needed training were given very specific guidance that because of the following things in your track record, we need you to complete this training. And there was a clear um, understanding as to why certain training was assigned to an individual. Next example that I, I love, I haven't seen this, I've only seen this in really uh, amazing and cutting edge um, security cultures, but tying a human risk score to incentives and bonuses. I've seen this, especially in the financial industry, where once you can effectively quantify this, you can tie people's bonuses to ex excellent security performance, making it a motivating activity for everybody to get aligned. As long as you're giving people clear and transparent communications, uh, around where they stand and what they need to do to get better. And then the last, uh, which is another use case that uh, I'm seeing more and more, is understanding what kind of tools and technologies to deploy to certain key areas of risk. So let's say you have a limited number of licenses of a password manager to deploy. Who are you gonna roll it out to? How do you decide? So that's one, one way of thinking about ap applying this type of risk score where I've seen it um, have really meaningful business impact are more um, technologies that introduce more business friction. So uh, one of them is a web isolation technology, excellent at stopping malware introduced from, uh, from websites. However, kind of a clunky experience for some, some individuals. But 
with you can understand which employees are truly of highest risk, both by access and by their security mindset, you can make sure that you're deploying some heavier security technologies, but only to the employees who really need it. You're maybe monitoring and logging data from the, your highest risk employees, but not everybody. So you're saving time and dollars on logging costs. So it's another way of thinking about how we adjust our controls and our logging and our, and our technologies to map to these type of risks. That's brilliant. If I can just offer one additional anecdote, it's actually a, a pharmaceutical client that Masha and I both partner with. They're obviously very much a target and hot topic these days, given the global pandemic situation that we find ourselves in. But they've had a very high fidelity, cutting edge awareness and education training program and they have for years. But quite frankly, it wasn't enough. They needed to demonstrate, you know, the engagement metrics. Yes, that more people were engaging with interactions and folks were passing, you know, phishing tests, but it wasn't enough to demonstrate to leadership that the security organization had risk under control. And so with that, we're, we're doing this metrics-based approach to objectively score the human risk component of it. And then exploring, as I was mentioning those use cases earlier, how we can start feeding in primarily to identity and access management controls to once again, make those investments that the CISO, those great SNASI tools that the CISO has already bought, make those tools that much smarter and that much more valuable. And that's what it's all, all about. So with that, just to wrap up a couple of bullets uh, to keep in mind. So successful factors of a good cybersecurity program are outcome oriented to keep all folks happy, particularly our leadership that we, we report to, and it needs to be measurable. It is risk-based and tailored to that particular value chain. So this is another brilliant part of the, the type of data that you have within your environment. I'm talking about physical as well as a software uh, supply chains that we all deal with with our particular businesses. Tailoring it to the most risky, most high value parts of your business will also pay dividends as well in terms of reducing your, your risk threshold. Also, holistic and integrated people process technology. We have to have all three legs of that, that stool. And once again, I think as security owners and training practitioners, if you can have those conversations with your leadership and with your peers across the control families, saying, yes, we need to get all three of these in lockstep, we'll only pay dividends. Dynamic and adaptable to our lovely ever-changing threat landscape. And of course, supported, you know, it's my favorite quote ever, Peter Drucker, that <laughs> culture eats strategy for breakfast. So using this measurable risk-based data on human risk to further your efforts, great efforts to increase the culture level up, as I like to say, to have really strong and prominent cyber hygiene will only make your companies that much more secure and resilient against the threat landscape. So with that, who's ready to go build some Swiss Army knives? <laughs> Me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Hey, thanks. I really appreciate it. We've got a couple of really good questions. Um, I think one of the things that people would really like to know is when they go back to their organization, can you give us three examples of either tools or data types that they have in their organization that they can use to start getting this type of data, these yeah. type of metrics? Absolutely. So, um, yeah, let's talk, talk about the three most common ones I love seeing um, to start painting a picture. The first uh, is malware. I, I would argue that probably almost everybody in this on this call, with exception of maybe a 10 person uh, shop, will has some type of endpoint security solution. So um, that might be a carbon black, a crowd strike, um, are common vendors in this space. And uh, what those technologies do is they log whether or not someone has tried to download, execute, or uh, detonate malware on a machine, whether or not it was successful and quarantined later on. There's a lot of different stages. But that for us is pure gold, right? Because it shows that even if that attack was successfully stopped by this technology vendor, it shows that Susie actually tried to detonate the malware, right? That is where we're, what we're trying to get, get into. So similarly, you have that kind of technology in place for email security gateways. Common vendors in the space tend to be Proofpoint. Um, it's probably one of the largest distributed ones or competitors to them. You can also see about web browsing technologies. So uh, Zscaler, uh, Cisco has several technologies. Things. So the technologies where someone, or Blue Code is another one, where if you, uh, 
you work for an organization and you try to go to a website that says, oh, that was blocked, for what reason? Maybe it's, it is malicious, maybe it's inappropriate, but again, that's an indication that someone may not be entirely aware of how to safely browse. Um, so for, I'm sorry, I actually skipped over the email security solution option. What you're looking for here is, did someone try to download um, a phishing attacks that ended up being real? Did they end up reporting? Um, did they click on attachments? And you can get both of those phishing data sets, both real attacks and also simulated environments. Uh, but I encourage you to track both because you're looking for actually attack metrics. So those are three to keep in mind. Other technologies are data loss providers for sensitive data violations, CASB solutions, um, but there's a long list of this and I'm happy to share a resource in the hallway that maps behavior metrics and uh, data sources of where to find them. That would be very cool. And one of the things folks I've learned from Masha too is not, not only do you have a wealth of data in your organization, but don't be afraid to talk to others, say in operations or human resources and just discover what they have. HR, who would have thought HR, they may have data on audit or policy violations or things like that. Mm -hmm. Operations, or how about physical security? They could mm -hmm. let you know about lost or stolen devices. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, your IT department's a great resource as well. Yeah, all of those have really great data sets that you can start pulling in. Yeah, so it, it's kind of like, well, how do I measure behaviors? Well, once you start thinking about out of the box, it starts coming out. So there's lots of different ways to measure all these different behaviors at endpoint, DLP, email proxies, like your blue coat, HR, talk to operations, all this. And it sounds like, Masha, you said you have a resource you can share where people can learn more? Yep, I'm, I'll, I'll post that in the hallway chat right after this. All right, thank you. Um, yeah. Patrick asks, you mentioned human error. What exactly do you mean by human error? Shelby, you wanna take this one? Yeah, absolutely. So human error, first of all, can be categorized into two big buckets, either malicious, which has intent behind it, or negligence, and when there was some sort of lack of awareness or education of what the expected behavior was. But quite frankly, at the end of the day, it's a little bit of an asterisk there. We, we care about what actually happens. It, it, you know, if there, there's still an exfiltration of data, if there's still malware injected into the environment via, you know, via some sort of phishing vector, that's what we're trying to measure and an objectively score. Because it's also to a degree of, you know, when we're doing these kind of classic engagement or, or learning metrics, it's great that folks are testing that they understand phishing, but if they're still accidentally, you know, downloading and clicking on links or they're still accidentally um, executing malware, it kind of doesn't matter that they've attested to the fact that, you know, you still put the business at risk. And so that's where we're trying to flip the conversation a little bit. Those are still important because that, that helps you shape the messaging that you then have your, your intervention campaigns around. But fundamentally, we're, we're trying to score and discover what's actually happening within the environment to then put the controls in place. All right, and then real quick, we're, I'm getting a, a question or two for some folks. They say they don't actually have Slack access. Is there somebody they can reach out to, because uh, Slack is blocked by work, some way they can reach out to you to get access to some of those resources you mentioned? Yeah, you can find us both on LinkedIn and just send us a quick note. And um, I, for one, will post it on my LinkedIn channel, but also please do connect with both of us. Uh, mm -hmm. and drop us a line. And I know Shelby also has some awesome resources that she can share as well. So do connect with us and we will we will spread it out that way. Hopefully your LinkedIn's not blocked for you either. Otherwise, I, <laughs> I there, there's only so much. You can also go to the Elevate Security slash resources page for a lot of this. Um, and Shelby, if there's places that, that people can, can visit. Yeah, I'll post it in there. All right, Masha, Shelby, anything else? No. Thank you. Good luck, everyone. Yeah. <laughs>